The Easter Gospel lesson for today comes from Mark's telling of the resurrection. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, your servants wait upon you. And we pray on this particular day that all of the wonder and the power and the majesty that all of the hope and dreams and fulfillment of those dreams that are wrapped up in the raising of your Son, who is your Word, would not be lost to us this day. Lord, you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You may already know that in many Christian traditions on this Sunday, Easter Sunday, it's common to tell jokes and funny stories to help us capture or be captured by the joy and wonder and really the, I guess you could say the humor of this situation we find ourselves in as followers of a risen Savior. After all, you don't have to look too hard to, to sort of uncover the absurdity of, of human nature, of human sin, of, of the brokenness in the world. We're all too well acquainted with that. But there's also a, a marvelous and wondrous absurdity to the way God addresses our human condition by sending us Jesus, the Christ. And when the world did everything that the world could do to stop him, even killing him, even burying him but in a hole in the rock with a huge stone rolled in front of it and sealed up, God still raised him up. God will have the last word, and that is this wonderful cognitive dissonance to the way humans tend to look at things. And that empty tomb just stands there yawning at us, laughing at the absurdities of life, as if God is willing to say, in the most gracious way, you thought that would stop me? 
It is absurd. So we tell jokes and funny stories. And, uh, you know, preachers have a hundred children's stories and, and even funny uh, anecdotes. And I'm just going to share two or three of these uh, from, from my long list. And to me, these are some of the very best ones. One year on Palm Sunday, little Jimmy had to stay home with a sore throat from church. He stayed home with a sitter and the rest of the family went to church. They came home and his older brothers were waving these palm branches they'd gotten at church. And Jimmy didn't understand. He said, what, what are those for? And, and the boys, the older boys said, well, these, these were waved uh, uh, above Jesus' head as he walked by. And Jimmy said, wouldn't you know it? The one Sunday I can't go and he shows up. <laughs> Another Sunday morning, a mom was wonderfully, dutifully, and lovingly preparing breakfast for her two boys, Joseph, who was six, and Anthony, who was four, making pancakes. And the boys, were boy, they were licking their chops. They just couldn't wait to, their mouths were watering over these pancakes. And so they were talking to each other about who's going to get the first one. I'm going to get, no, no, I want the first one. No, I want, I want them. And so mom saw an opportunity to teach a, a, a moral lesson here. She said, boys, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. And Joseph quickly turned to his younger brother and said, okay, Anthony, you be Jesus. <laughs> Some of you with brothers and sisters can relate to that. I'm, I've got three older sisters, so I, it was like that in my house growing up. Finally, a kindergarten teacher was observing her classroom of children. While they drew, they were told they could draw anything they wanted to. They were given a little while to, in the art project. And one little girl was working so diligently, she just had to go over and see, what in the world is this little girl so into? And the little girl was drawing away on her paper with her charcoal and her crayons and whatnot. And, and the teacher said, my goodness, that's, uh, you're working mighty hard on, on your drawing. What, what, are, you, what are you drawing? And the little girl said, God. And the teacher said, well, honey, you know, nobody really knows what God looks like exactly. And the little girl didn't even look up from the page or stop working. She said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> Today is the day we're shown what God looks like. Today is that day. Sometimes it's not the kids, but others who, who point the way for us, and, and even when they don't mean to. This is really the best of all the stories I'm sharing with you today. Funny ones, that is. It came from a previous year's Maundy Thursday service at, a, at another church I served some years ago. And if you've been, to, you've been to Maundy Thursday services, you know that they're somber and we bring the lights down and the music is contemplative and the messages and the scriptures that we read and it's pretty heavy. And, and at one point at the end of the service, in that service, like most Maundy Thursday services, we, we stripped the chancel. That is, we took away the pyramids and extinguished the, the candles and uh, put everything away so that it was bare and before we sang, Were You There?, and right before we were to sing the song, the last thing that we did, I took the big pulpit, big heavy pulpit Bible and slammed it shut. And it boomed through the microphone and reverberated throughout the sanctuary. And one of our old saints had fallen asleep. <laughs> and when that boom hit the speakers and went through the sanctuary, he woke up with a start. And it was dark, so he was confused. And to his and his wife's eternal embarrassment, he blurted out, what the H was that? <laughs> and everybody reacted just like you did. Well, we sang, were you there? And we, you know, we're supposed to depart in silence, but he couldn't help but come find me after the service. So apologetic. He was just embarrassed. And I said, don't, don't be embarrassed. You, you probably got it right. We look at what we've done to Jesus. We look at what the world does to him. And we say, what, what the H is that? 
And today, you see, we celebrate that same breaking of those chains. The chains of hell and of death and of heartache and pain and fear and darkness. Guilt and shame. All those things have been rendered powerless. Phantoms as they are. Because now we have the presence of the light. We have the presence of the hope. We have the presence of God's power of life to say not even the dead body of Jesus in a cold stone tomb with a big rock rolled in front of it can defeat what God has in mind because now everything is different. Mark gives us the shortest and sparsest account, just eight verses. Oh, I know if you open up chapter 16 and go on and look, it's, there's verses 9 through 20. Most scholars agree those were added later. They had their value. But the oldest manuscripts seem to stop all of them at, at verse 8. And not only that, but if you read it in the Greek, the original language in which it was written, verse 8 in chapter 16 of Mark ends with a preposition. The grammar's all messed up. We clean it up in English and we say, because they were afraid, or for they were afraid. But it really reads, they were afraid because they were afraid for dot, dot, dot. They didn't use those, but that's how we would render it today on our computer screens. It ends with a preposition. You see, Mark doesn't deny or ignore the resurrection of Jesus. But he, he invites us to join him and the original believers in wondering, what does this mean? The first reaction of all those who encounter the resurrection scene is one of perplexity, even fear and terror and amazement. What can this be? How can this be? How many times do we hear... Uh, coaches, and we're in a season of basketball tournament right now, after they win a championship saying, we, we can't stay too long in celebrating this championship because it's now receding into our past. We must have an eye on getting better on the future, on where we go from here, what we do now going forward. So with Mark... We encounter this scene, we watch, and we wonder for signs of the resurrection. What does it mean? I use an example from political history, worldwide political history. We could name any number of them. But decades ago, for what, 40 years ago or so, when the Marcos, Amelda and Fernando Marcos, were still in power as the rulers of the Philippines. Things were beginning to wear thin. There were opposition parties and opposition leaders. One of them was known, uh, uh, or one of them was named Benigno Aquino. Corazon Aquino, his wife, later uh, came into power. But Benigno had been exiled for some years and had, had already uh, renounced violence, but had a very, very large following among the people. He was very popular and inspirational, charismatic. Well, it was determined that with, with great announcement and knowledge by everybody, he didn't hide the fact that he was going to come back, going to come back to the Philippines. Even though he knew what was at stake, probably his life. And in fact, no sooner had he stepped off the plane that landed in Manila and began walking down the tarmac towards the terminal that he was attacked and shot dead. It looked like his voice had been silenced. It looked like the Marcos would stay in power forever and ever. And yet, within three years of that killing, things changed, and the Marcos were overthrown nonviolently. 
and had to leave the Philippines. The fall of a despot began with the unrighteous death of a good man. Can you believe that God is at work bringing resurrection? A friend of mine tells once of being on a retreat some years ago in which the theme of the retreat was the names by which Jesus calls us. Now we might start with our baptized name, the name our parents gave us, and that's fine. But this retreat invited the participants to go deeper and to listen with scripture and uh, sacred readings and um, different guidance from the retreat leaders. What name do you hear Jesus calling you? By what name is Jesus calling you? And after the first two or three sessions, my friend didn't, did, couldn't really hear anything unusual or different. But then long about Saturday evening, as they were again engaging in some silent reflection, she began to hear it. And then again, and then again, sister, sister. And it was the voice of Jesus, but she heard another voice at the same time. That of her long estranged brother, sister. And thereby began, through the voice of Jesus, working in and through the voice of her brother, in her mind, a long overdue reconciliation, healing, and reconnection between a brother and a sister. Can you believe that God is at work bringing resurrection? Sometimes it's more traditional. And the windows that God opens up for us of resurrection are kind of right up front, right, right in our face. Herman Battle, for many years the pastor of First Baptist Church in Chattanooga, recalls of holding, after a long battle with cancer, and his wife, holding his wife as she died in his arms, and her saying, can you see the lights? Can you see the lights? And he said, honestly, he was always honest with her, no, honey, I, I can't. And she said, oh, but you will. You will. I know that was her faith at work. But I also know that she saw those lights. And she believed her beloved husband would see them too. That's a faith statement. It's not a statement of fact. It's a faith statement. But how powerful. How hopeful. What allows for that? What brings that about? What enables that? Resurrection. A conviction that what God has done and is doing in Jesus Christ is enduring, is the most important thing, is sure and true in the face of all the uh, uh, false certainties of the world. This mysterious, uncertain, discombobulating reality is what gives us life. It's what brings us together. It's what sparks our hope. Can we believe that God is at work bringing resurrection? Mark's question for us today is, can you believe that? Can you believe that God is at work bringing resurrection? I know Mark lacks a, a neat, tidy ending to his gospel. Mark leaves many questions unanswered. Why didn't those women go and do as they were told and, and share the good news? Why did they go home and kind of hide in terror and amazement? What about the disciples? What became of them? We have to turn to the other gospels to sort of piece that together. Mark leaves those questions unanswered. For heaven's sakes, he ends his gospel with a preposition. That dot, dot, dot. What are we going to do with those dots? How will we fill in the story? He tells us that the, Mark does, that the disciples 
Go back to Galilee. They're told to go back to Galilee, not to the halls of power and faith in Jerusalem or Rome. And the women are seized by fear and they say nothing to anyone. So Mark sort of takes them out of the, of the, uh, of the picture, out of the story for just a moment and leaves the reader asking ourselves, how do we provide the ending to this good news? What do we do with this good news? Where do we go with this good news? Mark presents us with a story that calls for our answer. Just like Jesus taking the disciples aside about halfway through his ministry and asking, who do people say that I am? They gave him all the answers. And then he says, oh, but who do you say that I am? The point of the empty tomb is that the story isn't over. The story is still being written on our lives, by our lives, and in response to this awesome news. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. In rising, Christ has broken the bondage of sin and shattered the power of death. And so we're left to ask, how will this story be written in your life? Thanks be to God who on this day of days gives us the victory. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen.